every one more person that's prepared is a win, in my opinion. Because um, we're teaching these classes because we're preparing to be prepared to help other people. So the difference between what, what I'm doing today and what maybe you might watch on TV like Doomsday Preppers is a Doomsday Prepper is preparing to be prepared and take care of themselves. But, you know, some of them are building like bombs around their house and they're ready to, to blow away anybody that comes near. I'm not advocating for that kind of prepping. I'm advocating that we're prepared so that we can help others, not kill others. So if I'm prepared, then I'm one less person that Red Cross or uh, government agencies or somebody else has to come in and help because I can take care of myself and then I can help other people that maybe didn't have a chance to prepare. But that being said, I would encourage you to encourage others to be prepared. Because let's say um, I was the only person prepared out of this group right here. How long could my preparation sustain all of us? But if every one of us were prepared in this group, then we would be able to sustain the group longer, right? So every everybody that's prepared is an asset for the group. And I have encouraged people, like, find a group of people that you would trust your life to and prepare with that group of people. So that if something happens, some disaster happens, okay, you can go to one person's house in that group. Maybe their house isn't destroyed by the tornado. You can all go to that one person's house. Or, you know, you can pull your resources. We're not all strong at everything, but if we can get a group of people, we can pool our strengths together and we can help each other. So find that group of people. It might be a people in your church that you're close to. It might be people at work. It might be some of your neighbors that you could pool together and kind of resource each other. And then the other thing is, what about old people? Like, what about uh, elderly single people? Who's gonna take care of them in a disaster situation? Or is it really, do we really believe every man for himself? Because that's kind of the underlying philosophy that most people live by right now. Like, every man for himself, Hope you got your stuff, because if you don't, too bad for you, kind of thing. But what are we doing to help other people? So I would hope that, you know, if you are preparing, then you think of older people, maybe, that don't have resources to prepare. If there were an emergency situation, you would be able to go and, and help that elderly person bring them over to your house or whatever. So you see what I say? When, when I say, are you ready, if you're prepared, you to help others, then that's just the reality. And if you think about situations right now, like there's all kinds of dynamics happening right now in our world. And I'm not going to spend too much time telling you about potential disasters and threats because every time you turn on TV, you already see that stuff. So I don't need to tell you what the, the potential is for disaster because we're basically living in it right now. So um, what you prepare for any disaster will help you prepare for every disaster. So what I'm sharing with you today is, and I, I think the best way to learn is hands-on visual teaching. So I'm gonna share with you, I brought a bunch of stuff up here, it's like, Disaster show and tell. And then afterwards, if you want to come up and, and check out anything, you know, feel free to come up, ask questions. Because the best way to learn is to actually see it and, you know, ask questions about it. And then go home and practice. Go home and do some stuff and practice. The time to practice is not in the event of a disaster. The time to practice is now. So, and I'm gonna be talking about that throughout. Um, we, I hope you all signed your name on the little piece of paper with your email because I have some cool stuff. I'm gonna be drawing names and giving away some stuff as we go through. 
So, um, we do live in an earthquake zone here in Missouri. Um, that is something. We have earth. We have we have potential of having a huge earthquake here in Missouri. Uh, what other disasters do we have? Tornadoes, straight line winds, floods, microbursts, ice storms. Uh, we could have blizzards, right? Um, we could have terrorism. We could have political unrest where we would have to shelter at home. So today I want to help you think about preparing for three different scenarios. And if you can prepare for these three things, then you will be prepared for any of those events that could occur in our area. And it's pretty, in today's world, it would be a pretty naive person to think that nothing is ever going to happen here. Right? That, that would be pretty naive, wouldn't it? I mean, something is going to happen here. That's just the reality of it. So when is it going to happen? We don't know. That's why we prepare ahead. And if we, we get prepared and we are prepared, then we're ready for whatever happens. So the three scenarios that we're going to talk about today are, number one, you may have to shelter in place. So what does that mean, shelter in place? Okay, where would that be? Okay, you may have to stay at work. Shelter in place for you might mean work. A lot of us, we spend what? 40, 50, 60 hours away from home. So we might have to shelter at home or we might have to shelter at work if there's a situation. The second thing is if there's an incident of some kind, we may have to get home from wherever we are. So what's the chances that you're gonna be at your house when an event happens? I mean, we don't spend that much time at our house, most of us. So the chances, there's about an 80% chance that you won't be home when an event happens. So that means that we should be prepared to get home. Now, I can't carry all my bug out bag and everything with me everywhere I go. I'm going to the grocery store and they carry a backpack. No, that's not realistic. You know, I'm not going to carry all my stuff to work with me every day, although I do have stuff at work. But if there's an event that happens, I want to be prepared to make it home. And then the third thing is you may have to evacuate. We may all have to evacuate this whole area. You know, you may have to leave your home. So are you prepared within, don't raise your hand, within five minutes right now, could you go to your house and take out what you need and what's important to you within five minutes? That would be a worthy goal. Like if you look at disasters around the world, a lot of people only had five minutes to go in and get what they needed. So it's really important that we, we plan ahead and that we think about that and we have everything in one place so that we can grab our stuff that we need. Now I'm not talking about, you know, china dishes or your favorite vacuum cleaner because that's not going to help you in a situation. I'm talking about what you need to survive in your important papers. Um, some of you have heard before, but... Um, one night, in the middle of the night, a few years ago, my sister woke up and there were flames all around her. She had her daughter, her granddaughter, her husband all in the house with her. There were flames all around. My sister had planned and thought through that event. If my house burns down, what, I'm, what am I going to do? And so she had planned that through. So she wakes up, she's in her underpants and her bra, she wakes up. Her house is all in flames. She grabs one thing, and her daughter, her granddaughter, and her husband, they go outside. That's all they have is the one thing that she grabbed. But she'd rehearsed it ahead of time. So she had every single piece of important information that she needed. Her house insurance, all their important papers, all of that kind of stuff. She had saved it all because their house blew just like 
it was a trailer house and it just blew up. There was nothing left of it. Had she not thought that through ahead of time, she wouldn't have grabbed that. Another lady's house was burning and she panicked. She never thought about it burning before. She got in a panic and she went to the hallway closet and she started grabbing rolls of toilet paper and she threw all the rolls of toilet paper out the window and her whole house burned down, but she saved like 36 rolls of toilet paper because she just panicked. So we really need to have a plan and think through what we're going to do in an emergency situation. And by, by listening and coming to a class, getting some stuff, what do you really need, and start thinking about it, you can gradually begin to figure out what you're going to do. If you don't figure it out now, you're not going to probably do the right thing at the time that it happens. So we're going to talk about shelter in place, we're going to talk about get home, and we're going to talk about what you would need to evacuate. So the first one is shelter in place. So you need generally an emergency supply kit that you should keep in your home, and I have lists of stuff for you there that you can use to kind of go by to guide you. Um, we should consider having an emergency supply kit for each person. So if you have kids that are away at school all day, they should have a little something at school, don't you think? We should have something at work. Uh, we should have something in our car. And then, of course, stuff at home, a full kit at home. At home, we should have some tools. Like, this is a tool that would shut off your gas and your water at your house. So you should have some kind of tool like that. Um, you, it wouldn't hurt to have in your emergency bag some kind of a saw or, or an axe. So if there were, if there were straight line winds or, tornado, or tornado, a tornado and you had a lot of debris falling down on you, it, it wouldn't hurt to have some tools on hand in case you need it. Or in case you have to like take your axe and bust through a wall to escape. That, would it be bad to have a whistle? in your kit, you know? So how many people have, were buried under rubble just in the recent disasters that we had and they're there for days and days and days and nobody can find them? What if they just had a whistle on them? It, it would mean the difference between life and death. So simple little things that you can do like that that we need to think about. So we need a, a big kit at home and then we need smaller kits depending on where we're at, where we're going to be, and where we spend most of our time. So shelter in place is probably the easiest one. So what if right now the clock struck and you had to not leave your home? There was a government curfew. You could not leave your home for two months and you had no electricity. So how many of you have water? Your pump's not going to work because you have no electricity. So how much water do you need? Okay, one gallon per person per day. So how many people are in your household? How many gallons would you need? And you, can't, you probably can't store that many gallons for a month, but you could have water and then you could have, what else? A way to get water. Right? Do you have any water anywhere near your house? Is there a little stream? Is there a river? Is there a, a lake? Is there anything near your house? So can you drink just any water? Why not? Okay, so it's full of bugs. Bugs you can see and bugs you can't see. There's no water on the earth right now that's safe for you to drink. So well, we just went on a two-week backpacking trip, my husband and I, to the Wind River Range in Wyoming. And the water is coming right out of a glacier. You can put it in a bottle and you can't see one thing in the water. It's perfectly crystal clear. But is it safe? It's not safe. So you need a way to filter that water. So even when you think about staying home, sheltering in place, 
Don't just take it for granted that you're going to be able to turn on the faucet and have water. See, we take so much for granted in our culture today. And we're the first generation in the whole history of the world that don't know how to take care of ourselves. You know, our grandparents could take care of their self. They were self-sufficient. They grew their own food and, you know, we're the first ones who can't do it and even don't know how to do it. I have had to recently teach a, a grown man how to strike a match. He did not know how to light a match. He had no idea. I gave him the little box with the wooden matches in it. No idea how to strike a match. The more urban we are, the less country we are, and the more urban we are, the less we know how to take care of ourselves. So think about this. How many millions of people live here in Kansas City Metro? And how many of all the people that live here in Kansas City Metro do you think could take care of themselves or are prepared to take care of themselves or even know what to do to take care of themselves? So it's less than 10% of people that are prepared. The percentages are small. They are going up a little bit, but it's still very small. And there's government agencies. Every government agency is screaming for us to prepare. And still, like, the average person is not prepared for any disaster. So if you shelter at home, you should have some type of light at your house, other than electricity. Now, what would it hurt you if maybe once a month or every other month you pretend like you don't have electricity use candles uh, get a kerosene lamp and just pretend like you don't have electricity and and could you survive will it kill you we we almost think we're going to die without our modern conveniences but we're not it won't kill us uh, once a month, pretend like you have no electricity and you can't use your stove if you have an electric stove. So, how are you going to cook your food? What other kind of method do you have to cook food besides the stove that you use every day? You have another method. Okay, so if you have a gas grill or a charcoal grill, that's an alternative. The idea in preparing is that you have two or three ways to do everything. Okay, so you have one way to cook, you use your stove, just like normal. The second way to cook, if you have to shelter at home, is you use your gas grill or charcoal grill, right? What would be a third way? You could build a fire in your backyard, right? Build a campfire. Do you know how to cook over a campfire? Um, basically, all you need is a tin, uh, a tin cup or stainless steel cup and boil some water over a campfire, right? I mean, when's the last time you actually practiced doing that? Or have you ever? You see, that's something, you know, if you, if you were starving to death or freezing to death and you needed a hot drink and you had no way to heat water in your house, I would take a chair from my kitchen table, take a chair, break it up if I didn't have any wood, and start a fire in the backyard, right? I mean, survivors think outside of the box. They have even written books about why do people survive in different situations. And people who are survivors, they think outside of the box, and they, they multi-purpose everything. So they think this is this is a cup, but what else is it? It's a pot. It's a cup to drink out of. It's a pot. What else is it? It's a sterilizer for wounds. Okay, it's a it's a shovel, right? So you begin to think, what multiple uses does this have? And really, like, everything has multiple uses, and we need to begin thinking that way. So it wouldn't hurt to have some other kind of little stove, and I have some samples of different kinds of stoves up here. Some burn with wood, some burn with fuel. Um, 
having a small stove if you have to leave and you have that in your bug out bag. How many of you could carry your, ga your, your gas grill if you had to leave? Um, that's not realistic, right? But it's handy as a second way to cook food if you had to shelter in place, but it's not something that you can carry with you. Um, having some candles at, on hand, what about food? If you had to stay right now at your house for, let's say, two months, would you have enough food? What if it were three months? A lot of people just go out and buy what they need for the next few days. They don't have any extra food stored up. So um, every time you go to the grocery store, buy a little something extra. Put a little can, you know, maybe it's 60 cents or 80 cents for an extra little can of something. And then put that away so that you have some canned food. Canned food is great for shelter at home because all you have to do, use your hand crank can opener, open the food and eat it right out of the can. You don't even have to heat it up, right? So canned food is great. Peanut butter is a great food to have on hand. Where I'm from, I seem to have a spot right there. Where I'm from in northern Michigan, everybody puts peanut butter and crackers in their trunk because we have big blizzards there and people can be, you know, you can be stuck in the snow for a long time before somebody can come and help you. And peanut butter and crackers, just standard fare to have in your car for a situation. So, you know, think about what could you have in your cupboards at home ready to go for like instant meal. You can even get these kind of little quick meals at the store. Boil some water, you know, they cook fast, just a few minutes and you have a meal. So that kind of food, this is also kind of lightweight. So you could also throw this in your bag and take it with you if you needed to. So sheltering at home. Plan to shelter at home for a couple months at least. I mean, that's very realistic in today's uh, environment that you could have to shelter at home for a period of time. Lamps. Yeah, there's a company, and I, I have a couple years ago, or la I don't know, sometime when I did one of these seminars, I ordered a bunch of catalogs from Lehman's, and I, I still have some of those. And where's Bob? I mean, Ed, could you have Bob get those out of the back of the car? And then afterward, you can take one of those. You can order, like, back in the olden days, people, you know, did a lot of stuff that and they had the tools to do the kind of stuff that you didn't have electricity for. So I don't work for Lehman's. I have no like stocks or bonds in their company or anything. But if you want to order some of those old type things that don't require electricity, you can get it from this company, including the lamps for broken kerosene lamps. So shelter in place is the easiest. And I would say that right now, most of you probably have quite a few emergency items at your house, but I would guess that most of you don't have them in one place. So your first assignment is go home and find your flashlight, find your candles, and find, you know, some of the things that you would need in an emergency and put them together in, a, in one place in a bag. Everybody knows where they are. Maybe, you know, they're in that first closet when you walk in the door or they're somewhere, everybody knows where they are. So the moment you don't have electricity, the moment something happens, that's instantly where you're going to be. You're going to go get that bag. You have matches in there, you have lighters, you have candles, you have flashlights, you have extra batteries. So even if you had to shelter at home, you're prepared for that. If you don't do it now, when the thing happens, you're going to be floundering around in the dark, like, where 
Where was that flashlight? You know, you're not going to know where it is. Um, it would be a good idea to have some rolls of plastic. You can buy these big rolls of plastic at Walmart. They just cost a few dollars and a couple rolls of duct tape. So if you had to seal off some windows at your house, then you would be able to do that easily. The thing about sheltering in place is, you know, most of us have a house that has more than one room. So the bigger the shelter, the harder to heat. So if we had an incident in the winter time when it's super cold out and you're, you know, trying to stay warm in your house with no furnace working, then it's better to to think about like camping. Everybody stay in one room. You know, seal off the rest of the house and everybody stay in one room and seal the windows and then your warmth all, you know, whoever's at your house, all your body heat's going to be isolated in that one room and you'll be warmer. So it's like playing a game, you know, everybody stay together in one room. So you're like camping, but you'll be warmer if you don't have any heat in your house. So every winter, people die by freezing to death in their own home. And that just should never happen. If you knew what to do, that would never happen. Okay, that happens because people don't know what to do. So a little bit of plastic and seal off some room in your house and you'll be able to stay warm. And in the incident of some major explosions or chemical explosions, you can seal off the windows in that room where you are and keep all of that stuff from coming in the room. So you should have a few emergency toolkits. An emergency radio would be handy to have. I have them in one of my bags. Some flashlights, extra batteries, a hand crank radio. You can get these now really cheap. And you just crank it up and then you can listen. In fact, I was in Columbia, Missouri a few years ago doing a class like this and I took the radio out and I cranked it up and I turned it on and it said, this is an emergency broadcast. Your area is under severe tornado threat. Take shelter immediately. And everybody's like, ha, 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 that's funny. I'm like, no, dude, this is for real. <laughs> I mean, it was the real deal. So it was kind of funny. So having some tools at home, a way to turn off the gas at your house would be a, a good thing to have. You should also have a map. Like, do you know? Do you know where to go? Do you know where's the, if there were a tornado and you don't have any place to, show, to be protected from a tornado at your house, do you know where to go? Do you know where the nearest shelter is in your area for tornado shelter? Have you even thought about it? But if you don't have a basement in your house, where do you go? I mean, we, we need to think about that. Where's the nearest, who's the nearest? that has a basement or where is the nearest shelter in my city where I could go to, for protection. Um, it wouldn't hurt to have some masks at your house. And really, like, what would it hurt to carry a mask with you all the time? Just carry a mask. Like, uh, what if there were uh, an incident at your work? big explosion full of, think of 9-11 and all the debris in the air. You know, why not just carry a mask? You can easily carry it in your purse. You can, you know, keep it up. Put them around and keep them. What's with the microphone? It keeps going in and out. Is it bothering you guys? Okay. Yeah. It's not bothering them. Oh. We'll just keep doing it. Okay. That I, have, I have my hands free. Okay. All right. Any questions about sheltering at home? Mm -hmm. 
So is it still open? Oh gosh. Is it still okay to eat well, right the, out of the can? the kind of cans of food that I buy don't say that, and I would feel comfortable eating them. I, I would say if it's something in a can that you would, would question, then you could still heat it up if you had something to heat it up with. Thank you. So I've, I've never seen a can that says you must sterilize, so I don't know. Anybody else have expertise in that? I just don't know. So having a mask on your on your person, carry it in your purse, keep some in your glove compartment of your car, have some at home, have extras in case people are at your house or people come to your house, have some extras. Um, how long would food supplies last at the store if there were an emergency? Like one day, they're gonna be gone in one day. It used to be back, back in time, that grocery stores had big warehouses behind them and they like stored the food but that is not the case now so and if there's a big disaster who's going to come to your rescue i mean isn't that way what we expect like somebody's going to come to our rescue no that's not happening all the government agencies are going to be so busy with critical issues that they're not going to come and bring me a can of soup. All right? They're just not going to be able to do it. But if I'm prepared and I'm not in a crisis, then I can help the government agencies to go out there and find people that are in crisis and be a helper and help supply what's needed. So water is important. You need to have water on hand. You can even get these little water pouches. But, you know... How else could get water very cheaply for shelter in place? Yeah, you could fill your bathtub with water. In fact, you know, that's the way I grew up. Anytime there was a threat of bad weather, we plugged the bathtub, we filled it with water. So there's a lot of gallons of water right there. But for drinking water, you know, if you buy juice, you buy soda, and you have these bottles, wash them out and put water in them and then store that somewhere. And you have, what, free? You don't have to buy some fancy little pouches of water. You just have free water. And store at least a week's worth of water for everybody in your house. That's one gallon per person per day and have that water. You can buy these big five or seven or ten gallon water containers and fill that up. But, you know, if you don't have the money to do that, just use the containers. Instead of throwing the container in the trash, fill it with water. Stick it under the bed if you don't have a place for it. You know, put it somewhere. You can put two drops of water in a gallon, two drops of bleach in a gallon of water, and that will keep it disinfected for a year. So, you just keep it and drink it. And it's not like water goes bad anyway. It just loses a little bit of its oxygen. So all you have to do is if you have old water, just dump it back and forth between two containers and it re revives itself. Mm Yeah. yeah. So again, think of alternatives. If you can't take a shower, what do you do? Just stay grubby and filthy? No. There's other things that you can do. So having some baby wipes in your kit is, is an important thing. So if you had to have an extended shelter in place, then you would want food and water. And I want you to think about this too. A lot of people go out and buy like 50 pounds of rice and 50 pounds of beans. Now, rice and beans have no shelf life. They'll last forever, okay? They'll, you could buy a bag of white rice and it will last your entire life. So it's a good thing to have. But if you're in a situation where you have limited fuel and limited ability to cook, 
would, how long does it take to cook rice? I mean, if you just had, let's say this, and you had, you had raw pinto beans, how long would it take you to cook? Yeah, so you need to think about having some kinds of foods on hand that would be quick cooking for shelter in place. That's why I suggest having some canned foods that would quickly do it. The, where is it? The basket. If everybody signed that, you can, I'll take that. All right, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk in detail about food and water and stuff in a sec. So any questions about having some quick cooking kind of foods at your house ready to go? Is that something simple that you think you could begin to do? You know? Yeah. So she said tomato-based food, the acid eats through the can. So those kind of canned foods do have a shelf life, but you know, it's not 25 years, but it's not a week either. So it's important when you have food, buy the kind of food that you would normally eat and rotate it out. Use your can of tomatoes and then replace it with two or three more cans of tomatoes. And then keep rotating it out. Use your most current one so that you always have the fresh supply behind that. And don't buy some weird food that, you know, you despise. Because when you're in a crisis situation, food is one of those things that not only nourishes you, but can comfort you in a crisis situation. So, you know, if you hate chicken noodle soup, don't buy a case of chicken noodle soup for the crisis. Because that's not going to be a help. Get something that, that you like and that your family likes, and you can rotate it through your normal, your normal groceries. Just get your normal stuff, but just have extra so that you could live on that for extra you know, weeks if you needed to. So shelter in place is easy. We're going to talk about get home now. What if the event happens while you're at work? So you need to think about how far is it from where you work to your home. Anybody work more than five miles from their home? So the average, the average is about 15 miles. Um, I work maybe 25 miles from my home. So if there were an incident and I had to get home, do you think I want to walk 25 miles in this? I mean, I could if I had to, but. I would prefer not. So guess what I have at work? I have a pair of tennis shoes, I have a pair of wool socks, I have a little emergency kit. So in the event that some horrible thing happened and I could not drive home, all the roads are destroyed, let's say or whatever, I can't drive home, then I can walk. I could walk 25 miles if I had to. If I had a little bit of food and some water, and you know maybe some rain protection and some warmth we could do it right if we had to so we need to be prepared for that event because what we want to do is have a plan so if there's a, a big disastrous event we all have a plan in our family we're all going to get home okay we're all going to try to get home that would be the first meeting place but when you get home if home's destroyed what should you have an alternate plan, always two or three ways, right? So you should have a secondary place that you're going to meet. So if our home is destroyed, where we're going to meet? Some people say, you know, if you have a church family, it's like your second family. So if my home is destroyed, we're all going to meet at church. So all your church family meets at church, you pool your resources and you survive together, right? Or maybe, you know, you have other groups that you can go and, and you meet with. Or maybe there's a park outside of town and that's going to be your second or third meeting place where you're going to go. So your family knows if you're not here, where you're going to be. 
you're going to be at the number two spot. If you're not at the number two spot, you're going to be at the number three spot. So, and if you're not at any of those spots, what does it mean? You might be buried under that dusk at work, blowing your little whistle, drink, eating your food and drinking your water that you have, and hopefully somebody's going to rescue you, right? I tell my coworkers, here's my key. In that drawer, there's emergency stuff. If there's an emergency and I'm not here, everything you need is right there, except get your own shoes because you don't wear my size, right? So to get home, you should have some kind of little kit to get home. Personally, like I carry a little, I carry this little emergency kit in my purse. So it has the mask, it has a compass, um, it has some water tablets in case I need water, it has some rope, has a knife, screwdriver, a few little things. And it's light and I just carry it in my purse. I can't tell you how many times um, people will say, hey, Angie, give me your knife, I need it. Give me your screwdriver, I need it. And so, you know, it's handy. If I was a guy, I would just carry this all in my pockets and, you know, have it hanging off my belt. I mean, it's easy, right? You can just carry that. A guy can carry like a multi-tool and a flashlight and, and whatever. This is a little Maxpedition. I bought it on Amazon, and then I just put my own stuff in it. So you can get these little cases and then just fill it up with what you want. So it's nice to have in a little emergency kit. And then if I had to get home, I have something like this. Just a normal bag. Do I look like a, like a doomsday military prepper? So what you want to be is called the gray man. You want to just blend in. So if I, if I have like a military bag and I have flashlights hanging off of it and tactical gear and everything, I mean, I look like I'm prepared, right? So if you look like you have all your stuff together, then it's not, you know, yes, somebody's just going to come take yourself. If you're like a gray man and you just look like a normal person, I mean, who wants my purse? Nobody, right? But in here, I have several things that I would need to get home. I could heat, I have, I could heat food, I could cook food, I have a little bit of food, I have rain stuff. I could take care of myself with this if I had to walk, you know, even more than 20 miles. I could get home with this. So I have a way to stay warm, all of that. But it just looks like just a normal lady's bag, right? So, and that's what you want. Now, it's not... I'm not walking for 14 days, right? So I just need a little something in my bag to get me home. Just enough to get you home. And everybody's different. So you have to think about how far would you have to go from your work? What would you need? What potential weather would you have to face? That's what you need in your bag. You're gonna need some energy, so you need a little food. You need water. You know, stuff like that. Yes. Yeah, so if it's winter, you need a hat. You need some mittens. That's why I have wool socks at my work. So some wool socks, even when it's wet, wool can keep you warm. So it's good to have some wool socks. So just simple get home bag. I gave you a list on your handout. You have a list of some items that you could put in your get home bag. Now, there's little emergency kits, watertight survival kit, okay? You can buy these little kits. Okay, this kit has a compass, a space blanket, a light stick, and a towel. So if you had to walk 20 miles, would this be sufficient for you? If you had to walk 20 miles. It, it's not sufficient for me. Okay, it, it might be handy. This is an emergency blanket. It's kind of like tin foil. And if you wrap your body in it, like that, and you wrap up in it, then it keeps all your heat in your body. I have slept out in, the, in a snowstorm in a space blanket when it was 20 below zero. And I'm, I'm still here. 
you know, I lived through it. I wasn't comfortable, but I, you know, I didn't freeze to death. So it's not bad to have a space blanket. It's also waterproof, so it would keep me dry. But it's not enough for me. I want more than that. So you can, you know, this is a, a first aid kit. Has a few things. Has rubber gloves, has some band-aids and stuff. Is that sufficient? It's not sufficient for me. So whatever you get, you need to like beef it, beef it up a little bit because it may not be efficient. This is another emergency kit that you can buy. It has a compass, it has a couple of band-aids, has some wire, safety pins. I mean, any of you going to try to snare a squirrel on your way home? Probably not. You know, it does have a whistle. So, you know, go to Walmart, buy a few whistles, put one on your desk, keep one in your car, carry one in your purse. It just is smart to do that, have a whistle. This is Ready America Evacuation Essentials Kit. So it has goggles, it has a lamp, it has a whistle, has a mask, has a space blanket, a food bar. So one food bar. And this is a single person kit. It has goggles, mask, survival blanket, food, water pouch, whistle, pocket tissues, and a pair of gloves. So is it better? Yeah, it's, it's better, but still not enough for me. So having this at your desk would be something. You put the mask on, put the goggles on, you have a little water, you have a little food. I mean, it's something, it's better than nothing. Any one of these things is better than nothing. But you need to decide what is sufficient for you. So if you had to get home, you want to make sure that you have what is sufficient for you. And the less it looks like a prepper bag, the better off you're going to be. So a few things you can put in your kit. I'm going to talk about these things when we talk about evacuation. So it could be that you have to evacuate your house. You have to leave. Now my plan is not to go to the chief stadium with 50,000 other people and try to survive there. That doesn't sound like a fun party to me. I would rather be self-sufficient and find a little piece of grass somewhere and take care of myself and you know try to help other people than go into that stadium and live there with gazillions of people. So you could do that if you're prepared to do it. So you should have some kind of bug out bag. So a bug out bag is something that you can carry. And if you get the right kind of bag, even if you have back issues or aren't the strongest person in the world, you're going to be able to do it. So the key is, let me go up here so I can show you. The key is to get a bag that has a hip belt. So if you put the hip belt on, as soon as you put the hip belt on, the weight then is not here. The weight is on your body frame. So you might not believe this, but I have gone backpacking before where my pack weighed 65 pounds, more than half my body weight. But the reason that that's even possible is because the weight is on your bones and it's not on your muscles. So if you're going to buy some kind of an emergency kit or a bag, a bug out bag, make sure that you get one that has a hip belt so that you can carry it for a little bit of distance if you need to. Now, if you're not, like I'm an avid backpacker, so, you know, I buy good backpacking backpack. But you can get like knockdown versions of a backpack that have a hip belt for like $20. So you don't have to go out and spend $300. Just buy one that if you had to leave, you could actually carry it and you know, you could do it comfortably. And the only way that I think that's possible is if you have that hip belt. If you put even 20 pounds and it's just on your shoulders, most of us would be in agony with all that weight just on our shoulders. Our necks would hurt, we'd have headaches, and it's just not good. So you need a, some kind of bag to put your stuff in. 
you have this bag packed and ready to go and that five minute clock strikes, you can just grab that and go with it. So water is important. So you need to have water at home, but you also need to have water that you can take with you. Water is really heavy. So um, when I backpacked in Death Valley, there's not a drop of water there. You have to carry all your water. So we had to carry 65 pounds of water, 60 pounds of water at Death Valley. So water is heavy. You can't carry a week's worth of water in your backpack. You know, most of us, we couldn't do it. It's, so in that instance, you need a way to, to purify water. One of the simplest ways to purify water is to have this little guy right here. This is called the Sawyer filter, and it comes with a little bag. You can get this for less than $20. It'll do 10,000 liters of water. So it's awesome. You can get these at Walmart and Target, and you can just get them anywhere now. It would just be good to have some of these on hand. Sawyer, you can come up and take a picture with your phone or, or it's I actually gave you a handout with these pictures and the prices. So you just scoop up dirty water in this bag, connect it to the filter, and it has an arrow. So the clean water is going to come out here. Then you just squeeze the bag, squeeze it, and the, wa the good water comes out here into your water bottle. So it's very, very easy. Um, I don't think it's charcoal. Ed, do you remember? Yeah. So this is the big daddy of this guy. So um, this is the same principle. It's just bigger. Now you can buy these nice little ones. It does the same exact thing. You can also get water tablets. So these tablets, Aquamira are my favorite brand because you just drop a tablet into a liter of water and in four hours you can drink the water. So that's pretty easy, but it takes four hours. But it's nice to have these on hand. I carry them with me all the time just in case. And even if I had, you know, I was stranded somewhere, I had dirty water, I could drop that tablet in and just wait four hours and drink it. Probably not going to die of thirst in four hours, right? So nice handy to have. The This is called a SteriPen. So it uses ultraviolet light to kill the bugs. So you would just put it in the water bottle and you kind of stir it for about a minute and then all the bugs in the water are dead. You're going to drink the dead bugs, but they won't hurt you. Okay, so the pure filter, this is another kind of filter. This one also has the virus protection. So this one it has a hose, and you put the hose in the dirty water. So I've actually drank mud puddles with this. So put this in the dirty water source, and then you just pump it up and down, and then the water comes out here. And this one has the virus filter, so it will kill, you know, it will keep bacteria and viruses from going into your water. So oh, this is a good one, too. And, the, you know, some of them are cheaper, some of them are more expensive. So do what you can, but you should have some methods of water. How many methods do you need? Two or three methods of everything, right? So just one is not enough. What if you just have this and then something happens to it? Yeah, you can always boil water. But if fuel is, if you have a shortage of fuel, you probably prefer not to boil all your water that you have to drink. So, um, yes? Question. If you use the bleach method, how long do you have to wait after you put the bleach in the water before you can 
drink it. Um, the bleach, I don't recommend using bleach to purify water. Bleach is if you have purified water and you put it in a bottle and you put a couple of drops, then that will keep that water fresh for a year. Drinking bleach is not my preference for right. clean water. So, um, bleach is a poison, really. So, I would rather use a, a better method that doesn't use bleach to drink water. I know some people recommend that. I personally don't. So, um, yeah, I probably would boil the water first. I could always find a stick and boil some water, or I would burn right here wood, you know. I would probably burn something first before bleach. Any questions about water? Any more questions about water? You should be really careful because if somebody tried to play a cruel joke on you and they filled your glass water bottle up with bleach, you would think it was just water. And if you took a big gug of it, it would just about kill you. I know. Somebody did that to me once. And it tastes very salty. <laughs> I don't want to say who did that to me, but... If you're that's purifying a, a pitcher that's dirty and you have it on the sink and you have bleach water in it and soap and somebody chooses to drink it, <laughs> that's what he's talking about. Yeah, the rest of the story. So you should have some ways to start a fire. What's the easiest way to start a fire? Yeah, lighter. You know, next time you're at the store, buy some big lighters. Keep one in your glove compartment, carry one in your pocket, put one in your purse. I mean, a lighter is just a nice tool to have. You don't have to be a smoker to carry a lighter. So it's the easiest way. What happens eventually to a lighter? It runs out of fuel and then you're in trouble. So um, it would be good to have some other methods. I have a, a little bag here with several methods of starting a fire. Something handy to have on hand is just a, a fire stick like this. It's just a rod and if you take a knife, and I did this once and burned a hole in the church carpeting, but if you take a, a knife and you can just hit a spark off of that and start a fire. So if you carry this and some little cotton balls, just some simple cotton balls. Open the cotton ball up and put a little dab of Vaseline in the middle and then close it up. And if I set that cotton ball right there and I did this with my knife and my flint, the cotton ball would instantly start. And then they would kick me out of this church because I would burn it up. But, you know, have, have some methods of starting a fire. Just have some good old wooden matches. Yes. Little known fact about Kansas City and, and the uh, sewer system and the streams thereof. 85th to uh, the river and from state line until Independence city limits is combined sewer, which means when it rains, it pours uh, the sewage into the streams and into the creeks in that area, mm -hmm. but anywhere south of 85th, like I'd say solidly 87th Street, south is separate. So that means that when it rains, it does not pour sewage into the streams and creeks. It's a separate system. And up north from the Missouri River north, it's completely, no, it's completely separated also. And uh, not many people know that there's combined sewer inside of that Missouri River to 85th from state line to city limits of, of uh, independence. Just thought I'd mention that. Okay, good to know. Is that why the water in Missouri looks like chocolate milk? Just, just ask. So, um, fire. Different ways to start fire. Um, have a couple of ways. Have a couple of fuel ways to start fire. I thought this was kind of a clever thing. Somebody figured out. So they took women's makeup remover pads, just those little cotton pads, dipped them in wax, 
And then when you hit that with the spark, it'll burn for a long time. So I thought that was clever. Dryer lint works too. I think my favorite is the cotton balls and the Vaseline. It's so easy. Um, I was snowshoeing one time and we all split up to find firewood and stuff. And while everybody was out finding firewood, I just grabbed a few twigs, sparked a cotton ball, and I already had the fire going by the time people got back, just because it burns for a little while. Yes? A uh, magnifying glass is good to have, too. Yep. Yeah, you you can, can make fires easily with that. You can start a fire as a, you know, down the line alternative. You can start fire with a magnifying glass. You can even use a condom full of water. And the sun shining through the condom full of water does the same thing. Or you can do it with a water bottle. If you position the sun just right on your kindling, it will start the fire. I mean, it takes a while, and you have to keep the, the point of the sun right in the same spot till it finally starts the fire, but you can do it. If you think that you're going to be able to use a bow drill to start a fire by rubbing two sticks together, I mean, that is a, an old method of starting a fire. Um, it is very challenging to do it. I have done it, but it's very difficult. And even like trained uh, survivalists sometimes go days and days and days without being able to do that method. It, it's very challenging and hard. You have blisters all over your hands and... You know, it might look easy watching somebody on TV doing it, but they're not showing you that they just spent like six or seven days doing that, trying to get it to work. So having some of these other methods of starting a fire would be a good thing. Uh, cooking is important, and it's important to have some kind of way, like, okay, you have your stove at home, you have your um, charcoal grill or your electric grill, but you also need a portable way to have in your bug out bag so if you had to leave you could boil water. Now it could be something simple like just a cup that you're going to put over maybe a stove. So you can get little stoves like this that just go on a fuel canister. So it just rolls up like that. And it has, you know, three of them. So this would just go on the fuel canister, and then you have your cup, and it could just be that, that you have that in your emergency kit. So we just backpacked for two weeks and in the mountains, my husband and I, and one of these lasted us for a week, one of these, because of how we just boil water and then put the boiling water on the food. That's how we cook, so it just makes it easier. So there's this kind of stove, there's good stoves you can get, they're compact and you build a little fire in there and then, you know, this turns over and you have your little wood fire in here and you can cook with wood. So if you have a lot of, you know, trees around and you think wood is going to be easy to get, that's an alternative. You don't have to have fuel. There's stoves like this. This is a bio stove, so it burns wood inside. The heat of the wood starts a generator, so it's almost like a blast furnace in here. The flames will go round and round and gets really hot. And the heat from the fire generates a little charger, and you can charge your phone on it just from the wood. So... That still works kind of nice. It sh you should have some kind of, you know, kettle or pot to boil the water in so you can put your food in it if you need to cook food. Um, you can get these everywhere now. It's called a spork. It's a fork and a spoon, or a spoon and a fork, spork. So you can buy these at Walmart, like a pack of like five or six of them, you know, and then just throw it in your kit and you have it. They're real durable between just putting this in a plastic spoon in your kit is how long is that plastic spoon going to last you? It's just going to break. The first time you try to stir some pasta or something, the plastic spoon will break, or this one won't. Um, so you can come up after and look at some of the stoves if you want. Um, 
I do want to do a couple of these drawings before I forget. I might just be yakking it up up here and forget. So uh, we had some donate some water bottles to us. So I'm going to give away a water bottle. One is Buford. One is. So I have a water bottle. And this goes with it. They donated some of these. This is a little tool for your car. So when you drop something between the seats in your car, you can get it out with this. It's kind of clever. Yeah, so um, Elizabeth. Is there Elizabeth? Elizabeth? Okay. Okay, so she can have a water bottle. Yeah. All right, so you should have some kind of a first aid kit. Like, this is a first aid kit, but this is a first aid kit right so you need to think about what do you need in your first aid kit if you have small children you need different things in your first aid kit if you have elderly people you need some different things in your first aid kit if you have medical conditions you need different things in your first aid kit so there's not one standard thing where I could say this is exactly what you need in your first aid kit because it depends on your situation and your medical conditions. So you need to think about that. If you wear glasses, you should have an extra pair of glasses in your kit just in case. Um, so this is a first aid kit right here, a little first aid kit. It's the I go first aid kit. It's something that you can have in your car or you know, keep it at work or put it in your emergency bag. But any first aid kit that you buy, I would say beef it up. Enhance it. It's not going to have, there's not one kit out there that's going to have everything that you need. So you need to beef it up and enhance it. And I'm going to give this one away to somebody. Sure, 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 sure. Who's it going to be? Mamie. How many tickets did you put in? <laughs> that were the oh here's another Mimi. <laughs> Speaking of first aid, there's something that they have come out with that I think is pretty cool. And it's called a Wizzy Wipe. The original one was Wizzy Wipe. And I just like the name of it. I think it's cool. So this is a Wizzy Wipe, and it's super strong. And, you know, it's pretty strong. It's stronger than a Kleenex or a napkin or anything. And it comes in a little tube like this. And, or you can get like a whole bag of them. So what it is, you can just keep some, you know. I take them backpacking. You can just keep them in your kit. If you just put a little bit of water on it, can you see it? No, it just, it doesn't take very much water, just a little bit of water. And you have like this instant washcloth. And you can dry it out and use it over and over again if you need to. So it's just kind of handy. Um, when I was a kid, my grandma was a terrible driver. And I was so short, and nobody wore seat belts, you know. And I was so short that... I just sat on the edge of the seat, and every time my grandma stepped on the brakes, my face went into the dash, and I broke my nose. And I broke my nose over and over and over. And she just carried a washcloth in the car all the time in a, zip, in a Ziploc bag for my bloody nose that I got almost every time. So today, if that were the situation, of course, first we were called Child Protective Services. but. Uh, you know, just a WYSIWYG would be handy to have for times that you need it. 
So you can come up and look in these, and I'm going to give a tube of Wheezy Wipes away to somebody. Roger Stalker. Wizzy, Wizzy, W-I-Z-Z-Y, I I think. Um, This brand is called Easy Towel. But the original one was called Wizzy, Wizzy Wipe. You know, it's like Saran Wrap. I mean, you could have Saran Wrap, but it's not really Saran Wrap, right? It's a different brand. Or Kleenex. It's a brand name, but it's not maybe the one that we use. Any questions about first aid kit? It's important, you know, put some Purell in your kit. Really, hygiene is super important because if you're not careful, you can make yourself sick and everybody else. So the practice that we use when you're backpacking, and I think it's a good practice, is when we eat, we rinse our dishes out with water. Now think about water being limited, okay? You rinse your dishes out with water and make sure they don't have any like food particles or in them or anything, and that's all you do. But before you eat, you boil a little bit of water and you rinse the dishes with boiling water. That way you kill all the bugs right before you eat and you rinse your fork and your spoon with boiling water right before you eat, and then you're, you know, it's perfectly sterile at the moment that you're eating. Whereas if you're in a, an event, a situation, and you wash your dishes, and then you put them somewhere, and then let's say one of the kids just went to the bathroom, and then they come and they touch your fork, they touch your spoon, they touch the cup, you know, even though it's not even mealtime, and then you cook your food and you use the spoon and the cup. You see how, like, putting the boiling water right before you eat is, it works the best. So if you're in a situation, that would be the best thing to do. I don't think in, I don't know, almost my whole life I've been camping and backpacking and, being out in the woods, and I have not yet gotten any sickness from, you know, any contamination from that, from, from camping. I haven't had it yet. So I think the boiling water method works great. And again, having some wet wipes is just a good deal. Wash your hands. Every time after you go to the bathroom, you know, it's just good practice, right? Florence and Nightingale, newer stuff. So even, you know, every day, wash your hands. But especially in an emergency situation, if you're in an incident, make sure you wash your hands because that can save not just you but other people. You should have some kind of clothes that will keep you warm. Especially in the wintertime, cotton kills. So cotton, when it gets wet, it, it sucks all the heat out of your body. So it would be good in the wintertime to have in your bag like some alternative clothes, polyester, wool clothes, some high-tech kind of clothes, that even if you were wet, you would still be warm. And socks too, like a lot of guys wear cotton socks every day, but cotton socks would not be the best in a situation. It would be best to have some wool socks on. So have a little bit, bit of extra clothing. In the trunk of your car, you could put like a, an old coat. Maybe you don't wear it every day. Um, put an old coat, some wool socks, some boots, you know, a raincoat, just in case something happens. So you have that handy. You could even buy these little uh, things like this. It's just a, a poncho. And, you know, totally cover your whole body. It could be a shelter if you needed to spend the night. You have this whole shelter because it's a poncho. This happens to be a Norwegian military poncho. But it's huge. Like, I could sleep in this, you know. It's a, a big, like a tent almost. So I'm going to give this away to somebody. This is for DeWitt. DeWitt. 
So when you think about shelter, you need to think about two things. One is what is on your person. Is it shelter? Are your clothes shelter? Your first shelter is what you have on, right? So your first shelter is your shoes, your socks, your shirt, your mittens, your hat, a scarf, a coat, depending on weather. Now, I'm not, not going to carry a down coat with me when it's 95 degrees outside. I don't need it. But in the wintertime, if it's potential of being cold, yeah, I'm going to have some warm clothes, a hat, a scarf. So first of all, what's on your body? And then something to protect you. If you had to sleep outside, do you have a way to sleep outside? So of course, we could take this and this totally could be a shelter for me. I'm not even five feet tall. Okay, this could be like a, an A-frame tent for me. I could string a rope up and I could sleep under this, right? If you're six foot five, could you sleep under this? You know, your feet or your head might be sticking out thin. So you need to think about an alternative. So maybe have a, a tent, a tube tent, or these big trash bags and some duct tape. You can duct tape them together. Next time you're in a big city where there's a lot of homeless people, check out their shelters. I was just out in Salt Lake City, Utah for work a couple weeks ago. A lot of homeless people in that city. They have two-story cardboard houses. Two stories. Yeah, on their second story, they have chickens. They're raising chickens on the second story of their condo. So, and it's cardboard and it's plastic and, you know, trash bags. I mean... Again, as a survivor, you think outside of the box, right? And what, what can we use? Cardboard really is insulating. That's why so many homeless people use it. It's very insulating. So cardboard and some plastic, you have a house. Believe it or not, there are probably millions of people that live in cardboard houses. So we just don't think about it so much in our culture. So you can have, you know, you can have a $700 tent if you want, or you can have some industrial sized trash bags, but have something, right? Have something in your kit. You need to think about your pets too. Now this is a standard Ready America, is it ready? BePrepared.com, this is a standard emergency kit. This kit costs $50. I took a $50 bill, I went to Walmart, I bought a bag, I bought basically everything in this kit. You could do the same thing at the dollar store, Home Depot, you know, go buy basic stuff. Now, it's better than nothing, but again, you know, it would keep you alive, but is it enough for you? So, here's a, a rain poncho. Okay, that works, but is that military one going to be stronger? Yeah. Is a raincoat going to be better than this? I mean, the first time you stretch your arm, this is going to break. It's going to have a hole because it's really flimsy plastic. But guess what? I'd rather have this than nothing, right? So a poncho has some SOS bars. Now, these are bars that last for like, I don't know, 10 years or something. And they're high calorie dense bars. This lasts till 2020. This bar. These are like the kind of bars they put in like life rafts and stuff like that on airplanes that are going to last there forever. And there's 12 bars in here. And just a, you know, a half a bar would give you enough energy to do what you need to do. Drink half, eat a half a bar and drink some water. They taste like if you mix sawdust and an oatmeal cookie together and pressed it down hard, that's kind of what it tastes like. So I actually gave you a recipe to make your own. And the ones that you make are the ones that the Mormon church teaches people to make 
and they will last for years and years. In fact, the Mormons claim that they will never go bad. So, and they taste pretty much like these, so you can make your own. So I gave you the recipe in your handout there. So, um, yeah, the Mormon recipe. Yeah, so they're really easy to make. I would have made them, but I didn't have a chance to make them this week, but I would have made you some so you can taste it. But they're not bad. It's just like a dry oatmeal cookie. It has enough sugar, enough fiber, enough energy to keep you going if you need to, if you don't have anything else to eat. This kid has a, a flashlight. It has some duct tape, toilet paper, has a whistle, has a radio, has some water, um, a sleeping bag made out of emergency blanket, and it has a 115-hour candle. Now, the benefit of using these kind of candles is there's no wax to drip all over everything. So these kind of candles are nice. It has a little first aid kit and some hard candy. It's important to think about like diabetic situation. So it wouldn't hurt to have some hard candies in case somebody's having you know, a sugar incident. I think I put these hand warmers in here. And it has a tube tent. A tube tent is just tie the string between two points and drape the tent over. That's it. And so a tube tent, when you're done, looks like that, and you sleep underneath. It has a light stick uh, and an emergency knife and another poncho. So $50, you get all this stuff. Again, better than nothing. You know, for the cost of going out to a fancy dinner somewhere, you could have a nice little emergency kit with some things in it. This one is from BePrepared.com. It's, it's a website that you can buy emergency supplies. I like their store. I don't work for them either, but I like their stuff, and it's cheap. They're, like, very cheap. And their store is actually located in Salt Lake City, Utah. I've been to their store lots of times, but I like their, their stuff. So you can get a number 10 can of food from their store like this that would feed 40 people for about 10 or $12, which is, it's not this, but this size of a can of like vegetable soup or you know whatever a chicken like freeze-dried chicken or whatever for like 10 or 12 dollars so that's pretty cheap considering um, i wanted to show you that kit because you know if you don't have time and you know whatever just order a kit and at least you have something so for 50 dollars you have a kit but again you're going to have to beef it up so if you have pets, you need some stuff for your pets. So I don't know about you, but I have a little dog that's like four pounds. And I'm not just going to evacuate and leave her to suffer and die. Okay? If I had to choose between you and her, I would choose you. Do you understand what I'm saying? But I'm not just going to, like, I'm going to try to make some provisions and plan ahead so that I have some things that the dog would need. So we need to think about that, too. So a lot of pets in emergencies are just left to starve to death and die just because people didn't plan ahead and think about it. So if you have special medication, special needs, I already talked about that. Think about what you would need. It's important that you put some of your documents in your in your bag. So you should have, you know, like insurance, a copy of your insurance papers, uh, a copy of your driver's license, a copy of your passport. It wouldn't hurt to have copies of your credit cards and things like that. So. If something happened and let's say your house burned down, you grabbed your bag and you could go, you have those things in it. You should also have, I recommend along with a lot of other people, $1,000 worth of cash. 
If there's an event and you have no electricity, guess what doesn't work? ATMs, credit card machines, the stores won't be able to use any of their equipment. But if you have some cash, you can still get some stuff. So I recommend just having $1,000 worth of cash at home and having some cash in your emergency bag. And I could tell you lots of incidents in lots of areas of our country where people didn't have any electricity and the only people that could get anything were people with cash. So it would be, yeah, small bills, you know, even have some quarters and stuff because all these candy machines and pop machines around, maybe you could, you know, put some quarters in and get some candy or pop if you, if you absolutely needed to. So that's important too. Yeah. So yeah, it I mean that's that's a real potential, right? You can see the importance of having some cash. A lot of us don't even carry cash with us anymore, so that's really important. When it comes to light, there's a new uh thing called solar lights. This is a solar light. You can blow it up and then it has like a globe. So this is really handy and it has a little solar panel. So you never need batteries. And you just put it out in the sun and let it soak up some sunshine. I keep this one on the the bed by my on the table by my bed, and it just soaks up sun all day by the window. And then if there's an emergency, just push the button, and it's renewable. So these are handy. You can get these now, like for I don't know, probably less than fifteen dollars. You can buy different versions of this. So. I have this one. It's a little, a little round one. I'll show it to you. Yeah. So you know, no batteries to buy. So this one, you just blow it up, and it becomes a little globe. And this light will last for a long time. You can read by it, or you know, it's pretty bright when it's dark. It's pretty bright. So I'm giving this one to somebody. Sir, sir, sir. Who's it going to be? Laura. Laura. So those are nice. Um, we take those with us backpacking now because they charge all during the day, and then when you're at your camp or in your tent at night, they just work great. Um, it's important that you have some kind of good knife in your kit. A knife would be like the most number one thing I think that you should have because with the knife you can make shelter, you can start fire, you can get food, you know, you have a little protection. Um, a knife is really important. So it's important that you get a knife that that you're comfortable with and that you can handle. Um, you can also hurt yourself with a knife, so you need to be careful and, um, and practice, you know. This is called Light My Fire. It's a, it's a survival knife. You can get it on Amazon, and it has the flint right as part of the knife. So I like this one. This is the one I carry when I go backpacking and stuff because it's pretty lightweight, and I like having the flint right as part of the knife. It also has this straight edge here, so you can spark on the, the flint very easily. So, and this one is really quite cheap. Like my fire knives are quite cheap, and they're like, um, they're like standard. If you, if you research, if you did a, a YouTube video on survival knives or knives for a bug out bag, this is one that would come up often. And because it's cheaper, I mean, it's, it's, easy, it's more easy to acquire because it doesn't cost a lot of money. No, I'm not giving you that. Just so you know. I do want to talk a little bit about food. And um, 
So shelter at home is not a big deal. You just have canned foods and you know foods that you would normally eat. Just make sure you get start getting some extra food that you have it on home, at home. You can also get food like the military eats, meals ready to eat, MREs. So a meal ready to eat comes with an entree, and this one is vegetable lasagna, and then it has like crackers and peanut butter or crackers and cheese. Some of them have a dessert. They have like a little drink mix, like a uh, tang or like a Gatorade drink mix in them. So the benefit of this is it's, it's got the water in it. So all you have to do is peel off the, you know, rip the, rip the paper. There's the little, has a little thingy right there. Rip it and just squeeze the food into your mouth. You really don't even have to heat it up. I mean, you could drop it in boiling water, but you could just eat it, drink some boiling water, and just like shake a little, right? So, and they really taste like, I think military food has probably come a long ways. So they taste really good. And in fact, last week I was doing a class like this in a different city. And uh, somebody came up after the class and said, I'm starving, can I eat that? And I'm like, sure, eat it. So um, these are kind of nice to have on hand. And I'm gonna give this one to somebody. These also last for, for just about ever. Patty. You can try an MRE. So this is one type of food. The, the disadvantage of this, because it has water in it, it's pretty heavy. And you can come up and lift this. So you know, you could maybe carry one or two of these in your bag, but you know, you, you can't carry very many. You can buy freeze-dried food. Is this freeze-dried? No, this is just dried food. And this is like a backpacker meal. This will serve two people. It's pretty light, it's dried. It's not freeze-dried, it's dried. And it's pretty light. So this is expensive. You know, it's probably like seven, six or seven dollars for this, which is a little expensive. You could do the same thing at home when you're making food. If you're making a casserole, you're making chili, you're making whatever you make, rice dis dishes or noodle dishes or lentils or beans or whatever, just make a double batch. Put it on a cookie sheet and dry it in your oven. And you have this. Put it in a Ziploc bag, and that'll last for a long time, okay? So then just rotate through those, and then all you have to do is boil a little bit of water, pour the boiling water, wait about five minutes, and you can eat your food. And that's what we do when we're backpacking. We just take dry food in a Ziploc bag, we boil water, pour the boiling water in a Ziploc bag, wait five minutes, and then eat the food. We eat it out of the Ziploc bag, so we don't have any dirty dishes, right? We hardly use any fuel because all we did was boil water, so we're not, the food is already pre-cooked. And that's the kind of stuff you want in your bug out bag. If you could have like seven meals in your bug out bag, one for every day, at least seven meals, that would be good. You know, because if you had to bug out, and then you need to think, be thinking, what am I going to do after that? So in a survival situation, you're probably not going to be eating three meals a day. You know, you want to get ready for that now? Skip a meal every once in a while. Like, how do you handle not having food? You get, like, extremely cranky? You get viciously mean? Do you get a headache? I mean, so now we're all in a crisis situation, okay? We're all surviving here together at the church. All we have is this right here. And you're, you're going to get a little bit of food. So how are you going to handle that in a crisis situation? You're going to be ripping my head off every time we turn around? I mean, we need to think about the kind of person that we're going to be 
when we don't have what we're used to have, having. And I think the only way to, to figure that out is maybe miss a meal once in a while and, and, you know, can I still be a nice person and not have the food that I need? Or, you know, if I'm starving, you know, if I'm hungry, if I'm thirsty, if I'm overly tired, what kind of person am I? Because me turning into a crank in a crisis is not going to be helpful. And all of us collectively turning into a bunch of cranks in a crisis is just going to be a mess. Right? So we can think about that ahead of time. There's some of these kind of things, like I said before, when you go through the grocery store, look for types of food that are lightweight and cook fast and pick up some of those things and you can put them in your bag. These kind of foods like this are specially made. They're put in these cans. This one won't expire till 2036. So this is milk. It's milk for an emergency. So if you bought some oatmeal, which I think is a great emergency food, you can pour boiling water on it and eat it. You can soak it in cold water and eat it. You can put something like milk with it that's a protein and has some fat in it. You could have some honey. You could sustain your life just on that, right? So this is a, a nice thing. These kind of foods, you can get any kind of food at all in these kind of cans that will last for 25 years. And if you had some of these in your basement or put them you know, in your house somewhere, and you had some of these, these would sustain life. This right here has 93 servings. So that's a big deal, right? And most of these cans of food like this, like you can get single foods like broccoli or zucchini or carrots or what, you know, you can get vegetable stew, beef stew, chili, applesauce, strawberry jam. I mean, you can get just anything that you would ever want in these kind of cans, and they last forever. So you could get a supply of this, put it somewhere, and you have some assurance that if something happened, you have some supply of food. So I'm going to give this to somebody. Laureen. All right. So any questions about food? Okay. Mm -hmm. If you dry it and there's no moisture in it and you put it in a Ziploc bag, It'll last for quite a while. So you can also put it in a quart jar, put an oxygen absorber in it, in a, in a lid, you know, like your canning lids, and it will seal itself, and it will last even longer. So you just have to make sure you dry it good. Make sure it's perfectly dry. So you can use an oven. You can also use a dehydrator, which is a better method. But if you don't have a dehydrator, you can use the oven lentils are one of the best things to dry so a lot of people don't eat lentils but they're really cheap they have carbohydrates they have protein once you dry them in the oven they almost instantly rehydrate so at, at my work i live in raymore i work in lenexa at my work if you open my cube all my co-workers make fun of me but if you open my cabinet i have dried lentils, I have black beans and rice that I dried, I have noodles that I dried, that have dried broccoli, carrots, whatever in them. So for my lunch, I just grab some lentils, let's say, and they have seasoning and stuff in them, and I just pour boiling water. Uh, the Ethiopian group came to my house last year one time, and they made all the yummy Ethiopian lentils and stuff, and there was leftovers. They left them at my house. I dried them. So when we were backpacking in 
in uh, Wyoming just a couple weeks ago, we had Ethiopian lentils all dry, just pour boiling water. I eat them at work, just pour boiling water and they're ready to go. No, you don't need to put them in the fridge if they're dried. So you can put them in a, in a Ziploc bag and put them in a can, you know, a bucket with a lid. You can store them in glass jars, whatever. But just begin thinking of having some of these kind of foods on hand. You can buy them or you can make them. Having some of these kind of foods on hand so that you have them ready. I also want to talk a second about primitive skills. So let's say you had to flee your home and you couldn't take your stuff with you. You didn't have your bug out bag. You didn't have your, you know, emergency kit. You didn't have your... So in that instance, what would you do? Learn some skills to make do in nature what God has put in nature. We can learn some skills that would help us that our ancestors knew how to do. Our ancestors didn't go buy fancy stoves and fancy water purifiers and fancy tents. They knew what to do in the wilderness. So there's lots of books and YouTube videos and stuff that you can watch and maybe learn some skills. Watch a YouTube video on how to start a fire. Watch a YouTube video on how to build shelter. And just learn some things and you can do it. Any questions? about any of this. Okay, so that is basically called a wikia. <clears throat> a wiki, it's a, the old term is wikia. So it's just a shelter made out of debris, like old dead sticks and stuff. And if you had a tarp, you could put a tarp over it. If you had this, you could put over it. And you could have a shelter. One time I took friends up to northern Michigan and we built just like shelters out in the snow and used space blankets over the top and put more snow and just dead sticks and stuff and built little shelters and slept out there overnight. So <clears throat> what you need, food, water, shelter, first aid. But in what order do you need those? Food, water, first aid. How do you know? A diabetic sugar attack. What do I need? I need food or first aid, right? What if it's 20 below zero and I don't have a coat? Then I need shelter. What if I haven't had a drink for two and a half days? Then am I going to take my time to build a shelter or am I going to be looking for some water, right? So the situation dictates what you need first. So you need to think about priorities. What do you need? You can drink snow, but you have to boil it. Yeah, you can drink snow, you have to boil the snow. And uh, it takes a lot of snow to make a little bit of water. So it's really not, sometimes we think, you know, that snow is white and you can eat it, but snow is not pure. Snow is going through the atmosphere and picking up little particles. It's actually ice frozen around a particle and you can't see the particle. So even eating snow is not the safest thing to do. You should boil it. You can drink rainwater. Okay, if you can catch rainwater, you can drink rainwater, but you shouldn't eat snow. So I have, I have slept outside in one of those little shelters like that without a tarp, just eating a stick. I couldn't even tell you how many times just literally tons and tons of times in my life. And you can make it very comfortable. What you need to also understand is the earth 
right here, the earth is not your friend. If you lay down in more ways than one, but if you just lay down on the ground, the ground can kill you. The ground will suck all the heat out of your body. You always need something between you and the earth if you're going to sleep outside. So if you're using natural debris, you need like a foot of leaves and grass and sticks between you and the ground. Or you need a sleeping pad. You know, you can buy just a sleeping pad or you can, you know, buy for $200, you can buy an expensive sleeping pad, but you need something between you and the earth. Even if you took a sleeping bag and laid it on the ground, you could freeze to death because the sleeping bag is not going to insulate you from the coldness of the earth. So you need something between you and the ground always. So if you had to sleep outside, gather up all the leaves, break off branches, use grass, make some kind of mat between you and the ground. Any other thoughts or questions? Yes. Bugs. Um, I think it's important that you have some bug spray in your kit. You know, put some bug. Uh, DEET is, is important. I would rather be covered with DEET than have, a, you know, a thousand bites on my body that you have to deal with. You can get infection in the bites. Um, you can get diseases from the bugs. So, have you ever seen that show on TV called Alone? There's a show on TV, it's called Alone, and there's one called Naked and Afraid. And they put people out there, the Naked and Afraid one, they only have like what they, they have on their body, which is nothing. And they have to stay in these jungle areas, and they're just covered with really thousands of insect bites. So you don't see the repercussions of that, but all those poisons in their body could affect them for years down the road. So having some D in your kit would be good. They did an experiment. I know you've heard lots of things about bug sprays. They actually did an experiment, and they took a group of people in a mosquito-infected area, and they had one guy strip naked, and they put Avon Skin So Soft on him because that's a, a, you know, one of those legend things that that works for bugs covered him in skin so soft, took another guy and had him eat a bunch of garlic before they went. He ate like tons and tons of raw cloves of garlic. They took another one and had him take a bunch of vitamins. I forget what vitamin it is, but took a bunch of this vitamin that's supposed to make bugs so they don't bite you. They took another one and took like a knockoff brand of off, but not a name, name brand. Stripped him naked and had him, you know, they're ready to go out into the mosquitoes. They took another guy, put nothing on him. And he was just going to build a fire and let the smoke from the fire, like, keep the mosquitoes off. And then they took another one and they put the DEET, the bug spray with DEET. So the guy that was naked that had nothing lasted like half an hour. And they just kept dropping like flies. The only one that could spend the night was the guy that had the DEET that really like kept the bugs off. It did nothing. Yes. Yep. So um, Ben's is good. That's what we use when we're backpacking. We carry the little spray bottle of that. So it does work good. But it's good to have something in your kit. Think about like chiggers, ticks, mosquitoes, biting flies. Um, at one time when I was backpacking, the black flies were so many that there were literally hundreds of them covering our whole body as we walked. Black flies. And we could take our, take our stick and hit our body like that and a black cloud would go off our body of flies. It was miserable. And they, you know, we had the deed, we had, you know, clothes on. It was a hot summer day. We had our raincoats on and everything. They were relentless. So 
Having a bug net for your head is a good thing to have in your kit. So sometimes when the bugs are so bad, they go up your nose, you know, and they're getting in your ears and everything. So you can't put D like in all these tender spots, but you can wear a bug net and then that helps. Anything else? You've been sitting here for a long time. Listening well, yes. Yeah, so what I started what I started with is that we, you know, the ch it's a 80% chance we're not going to be home when something happens. So we should carry something with us all the time. A lighter, a mask. This is my little kit I carry in my purse. Um, have a, a dust mask that you can carry. Your kid should have one at their desk. So if there's an explosion or, you know, some kind of disaster happens, they're protected. Um, have some kind of little kit. Guys can carry some stuff in their pocket. You should have a kit in your car. So in the glove compartment of your car or the trunk of your car, have some kind of kit back there. I talked about getting home. So this is a like my get home bag. It just looks like a normal bag, but it really has a way for me to make a fire, have shelter, have some food, have water, have some protection, be protected from rain. That's what you want in your get home bag. Your kids could have something similar, some similar things at their at their school. Yeah. You could Yes, we need to do some more drawings. Does that answer your question? The handout actually has a list of all those things. Did you get a handout? Okay. Do you have more questions? Mm -hmm. So that's why this is this is short term to get me back to a location like home where I have more long-term stuff. If that long-term stuff is blown away in a tornado or I don't have access to it, that is where the primitive skills would come in. So what is around me? What kind of foods are there around me that I could eat? You know, how do I get water? How do I purify water without a purifier? That's where primitive skills are gonna have to kick in. And if you don't have any primitive skills, then hopefully you can find somebody. And that's, so, that's why it's so important to have classes like this, that we can learn some things and, you know, be motivated to learn some things. And I've taken groups like out in the parking lot. We've started fires. We've done that. If you're interested in having more hands-on training, we certainly could arrange that. We could learn some skills. So, you know, the worst case scenario, you pray to God and ask God to send you some help. If, you, if, if you've depleted every single resource that you have, I mean, pray to God at the beginning, but pray to God all along the way and pray at the end that he'll send you some help, somebody that knows something. So, but, you know, in the meantime, we could learn some skills. And that's why it's so important. There's lots of there's lots of books nowadays where you can learn some skills. There's lots of videos online, YouTube videos where you can learn some skills from people. We can also have another class if you want a hands-on class or we go out there and get down and dirty in the parking lot with fire and water and everything. Like we certainly could do that. Maybe you could put a sign up sheet out there, Bob, and if people are interested in that. Okay, 
So make sure we have your name on little slips, and then we'll send you an email. If you don't have email, maybe write your phone down so we can call you. Farkle, I'm glad you asked. So Farkle, I didn't, I didn't bring it with me, but Farkle is a little game that's this big. And when you're in a situation, it's really important to distract your mind with something. So like in my kit, I have a little deck of cards like that big. So, you know, if I'm with a group of people, we can play a game. Like you could be in a situation where you're stuck there. You, you don't have anything to do, you know, so it's important to play a game. Farkle is a little dice game from Minnesota. It's a little dice game, and it's only like that big. It comes in like a little tube, and it's a little dice game. It's so fun to play. You can play it with any number of people, so it's like the boredom buster. So you have some little things. Now, I don't want to carry a big board game in my bag, but I can carry a couple little things that would like, you know, especially if you have kids, you need something in there to occupy the time. We've even taken our knife carved out some little checkers, a checkerboard, burned it, like burned a piece of wood with a stick, made a little checkerboard, and cut out some little, you know, pieces of wood for X's and O's, and play tic-tac-toe or play checkers just with, you know, what you can make out there in the wild. So, we need water bottles. Okay. Chooks. Water bottle. Ed. And surge. And hmm. you know what that says? Something hall. Sean. Sorry, can't can't read that. And we have Justine. Okay, the list is up here, so when we're done, if you are interested in getting notified when we're gonna do that other class where we go out in the parking lot, Ryan. Paracord is a kind of rope. So this is paracord. It's really strong. Yeah, but it's made out of different strands. So really you could take one strand out of here if you needed to and just use the one strand. So it's like parachute cord. It's really strong. It bears a lot of weight. So it's very handy. It's light. It's easy to use. So it's good to have some paracord in your kit. So for building a shelter, you know, you need some cordage. So that's what's in my backpack kit. A women's down bag, a sleeping bag, is different than a men's sleeping bag. So women tend to get colder in different places than men. So a woman's down sleeping bag has more down in it in different places. So keeps women warm. We have one more. Joy soccer. All right. Any questions? Feel free to come up afterwards. Do you have anything? Do you want to say anything? Here, do you want this?
We're going to start, it's still a little ways off, this is the, tomorrow's the 1st of October, coming the 1st of November here, we're going to start a, a short prophecy seminar, and I just want to invite you to be thinking and praying about who you might be able to invite to come, because we're opening night, we're going to look at several different areas that scripture is very clear that says, if you don't know these spiritual things, you are likely to be deceived in the last days. Because not only does Scripture want to prepare God's people to get ready for the second coming, but if there's an enemy in this world who knows that time is getting short too. In fact, it says that he goes about like a roaring lion, seeking who may devour, because he knows his time is short. He knows that the, we're living in the last days of our history too. We're getting closer to the second coming of Jesus. And so he's got plans made specifically designed to deceive and we're going to look opening night on several different areas where god says this is what you need to be aware of so be praying about who you can invite and i hope you'll be able to, to bring people we're not going to do any mass mailing we're just going to ask our members to bring whoever you would like to bring and uh, um, it's, it, i said it was going to be a short series it's going to just go seven nights and one day so you know they go on a start on a Thursday, go Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday nights, and then Saturday during the day, and it'll be done. So um, just wanted to bring that to your attention. It, but if we do this again at the end of October, we're going to do um, survival skills. No, what did you call it? Bush skills, bush survival skills. Whatever. Primitive bush skills, survival, preparation, emergency <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and uh, so we're, we're going to invite, you know, remind you of that again then. Um, but anyway, anything else before we close with Why don't you pray? Okay, let's pray. We thank you, God, that you do care enough about us to give us a heads up on things that we need to be aware of, uh, not just to go through uh, spiritually to be ready for the second coming of Jesus, but how to be better prepared physically so that when times hit here in Kansas City, we can be prepared to be used by you to minister to people who are not prepared. And we won't have to worry about the things that we have on hand and we can go out and actually minister to help others who are, uh, are stressed and then we might be able to point them to Jesus too. Thank you for being the, the best preparation is Jesus in our hearts, Jesus in our lives. And thank you that we can receive that precious gift daily. We can even do it now. I ask you to please come into our lives again, keep us safe as we go to our homes, and continue to keep training and equipping us to stand for you as, uh, as we approach your soon coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.